Hello, and welcome to another edition of our Wednesday webinar from Grand Canyon University's Canyon Professional Development. I'm Corey Araza, your host, and I cannot wait to introduce you to our guest today because we are going to party like our life depends on it. Okay, so I just, I met this incredible person and I thought, wow, Vive 18. First of all, that's my Spanish in me, vive, right? So vivir means live. Living at 18, party like your life depends on it. I'm confused, but then when I started talking to Mr. Jake White, the chief prevention catalyst, I knew that he had to get in front of our audience of teachers, educational leaders, administrators, because I really think this is, an, this is such an important topic, especially considering um, the, the American Psychological Association just released statements about mental health among adolescent youth. So without further ado, Jake White, thank you so much for joining us. Very excited to have you here with us. Tell me just a little bit about Vive 18 before we jump into our presentation. Yes, glad to. And I'm glad that you're a little bit confused. It means we'll have great questions. <laughs> so yes, Vive or Vive 18, uh, Vive means to live in seven different languages. And I stumbled into this life-saving work when I was a college student. So here I am enrolled in this university in Wisconsin with one problem. All my friends wanted to go out and party and get drunk and high on the weekends, and I was not interested. I'd seen what it did to my family and said, I'm not going to go down that path. But what does that mean socially for me? Where am I supposed to party? How am I supposed to make friends fit in and feel good? And so instead of complaining about it, I took it upon myself to throw my own parties on a <laughs> college campus in Wisconsin, my own parties that did not serve alcohol. And when I tell people this, they're like, that's hilarious. Like who showed up to that? The Dean of Students and your grandparents? Like who would, who would go to this? But believe it or not, long story short, by the end of the semester, I had hundreds of students attending every party. I was sponsored by big brands like Pizza Hut, Red Bull, Chick-fil-A, Subway. And all these people wanted to help and support what we were doing because we were engaging students in a way that's positive, fun, and it's safe. And students loved it because they didn't have to worry about their friends or their future being jeopardized. So it began this journey where today I get to work with schools all over the country to show students that you do not need to use drugs to feel good, make friends, or have fun. Okay, I'm less confused, and I'm so thrilled that you are sending this message to our audience today. And, and I'm also very excited for a couple of reasons, but one of them was your very poignant why. And we live by a why statement. So would you just share with us your why and tell me why it's so passionate for you? Yeah, so we exist to save lives from addiction and boredom <laughs> with relevant, relevant, engaging, high energy drug prevention programs. And the reason why this is so important, Corey, is because when we think about what you and I experienced with drug prevention and, you know, our country had to figure out how to do this. We're always changing and evolving. So it was oftentimes a lecture or it was a scary recovery story or someone died and it was a big warning. And for what studies have shown is it's just not that effective. As young people, we aren't, we aren't concerned that bad things are going to happen to us. We feel more invincible when we're young. So these scary stories oftentimes would either be like, all right, well, that's not going to happen to me. Or, well, you're sitting here sharing your story with us. So even though you went through all that, you're fine now. So I can do whatever I want when I'm young. And like by the time I'm an adult, I'll have it all figured out just like you do. So what <laughs> the reason why no, I like I still don't have it figured out. So please. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's that's the funny thing about being an adult, right? Is like we still don't know what we're doing. <laughs> but I am so um encouraged by this. And here's another reason I'm encouraged. You know, you ended up meeting one of uh well, the a social media student of mine who said Corey, you've got to meet Jake White. He he actually lives on the Grand Canyon University's campus. And I thought, he does? So tell me a little bit about, I see you have a podcast microphone in front of you. So I'm so excited to, to share with the world your podcast as well. But beyond that, you're in a GCU dorm, are you not? 
Yes, I am. I am right now uh, <laughs> in Verde Tell me about River. that because you said you said uh, Wisconsin, and here here he is, Jake White, drug prevention catalyst in a GCU dorm room. Tell me a little bit about that, and then introduce yourself for us. Yes, um, moved from Wisconsin. We went on a national tour, my wife and I and some friends for the business, and ended up wanting to move. My wife chose Phoenix. We hopped here, met a friend at a Bible study who said. I'm a resident hall director at Grand Canyon University. He told us about his job. And my wife, Emily, said, that sounds like the most incredible job I've ever heard of. Will you please let me know when there's an opening? And she hopped on, on campus. Um, it's got to be like four or five years ago that we've been living on campus at GCU, enjoying all the amazing amenities, the awesome students. Um, just like you, you know, we have an intern program with the students. We're involved in the university and it's just a great place to live. So we're wow. living the dream. Thank you so much for influencing <laughs> and bringing your love and your life vibe to our Grand Canyon University campus. So tell a little bit about, I know this is kind of what you do, and then we're going to get into the meat and potatoes. Well, since you're from Wisconsin, I guess I can say that, right? <laughs> um, uh, of, uh, tell us a little bit about Vive 18, your assemblies and that sort of thing that you present. Yeah, our work mostly with schools looks like uh, a school will bring us in for an assembly, you know, that high energy, positive message, showing students that they can have fun, drug free. And then that's mainly in middle schools and high schools, although we are getting requests for some upper elementary and SEL presentations for lower elementary. But that's just like the setup, because yes, drug education is very important. And they remember a guest speaker, they get hyped about it and they talk about it, but we leave them with a call to action. So if the school wants us to start, you know, a youth led drug prevention club, so a Vive 18 club, we can actually help them set that up. So the impact lasts after we leave. Uh, on top of that, they can use our curriculum and then we can train their staff on how to build that positive drug free culture in the school to really support the students and their long term health. That's awesome. And I know that uh, as a teacher myself, they would have much rather heard from Jake White and his awesome <laughs> team than, you know, teacher Corey, who's uh, um, constantly yammering in front of the classroom. Well, no, I wasn't in front. I did a lot of differentiated instruction. <laughs> it's wrong. But tell me a little bit about your team. Yes. So, and just so you know, Corey, they need it from both. Like, oh. oftentimes we're saying very similar things to what you're saying a little differently and with some twists and games, but yeah, I, I get what you mean. Yes. <laughs> um, they listen to auntie more than they listen to mom sometimes. That's all I meant. Yep, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so Tomas Barraza, um, he grew up here in Arizona, has an amazing story of living a life that took him down um, drug use, the drug trade and how he wasn't fulfilled. So he's kind of our specialty speaker amongst those high school audience because he really connects with some of their like their situations they're in right now, the reasons why they're experimenting and trying. And then I'm more of the specialty among the middle school market where the majority of students are not using it. They're seeing it around and they want that excuse to not use. And so they see somebody who hasn't used their entire life. They really connect. And you can probably tell already I'm so goofy and weird. Like the middle schools are my favorite audience because they're the same way. They have no filter. <laughs> I can remember my son in middle school and let me tell you goofy and weird were definitely his adjectives so yeah he would relate immediately <laughs> exactly and then that leads us to Brian Wright uh, which people get us confused sometimes Jake White and Brian Wright but he is uh, a good old Wisconsin boy as well and just a masterful curriculum writer and I'm just not talking about content I'm talking about making the curriculum fun like the students have so much fun doing his programs. And by the end, when you read the data, like he's been awarded um, like worldwide awards for his curriculum. Uh, he was just flown to France to wow. get awarded by one for his, his work with his curriculum. So we partnered up and developed our Beyond Drugs and Alcohol and Vaping curriculum that we're using in schools across the nation and even just for restorative justice and things like that. Well, and I love that because restorative practices, restorative justice, it, that is what we need more of in our schools. Um, I know when I was a teacher in the classroom, and that wasn't too long ago, 
you know, the referral system. It's it's punish before reward. And that's just not the way that kids learn. So I can't wait no. to learn more about what you're going to share share with us today in creating a drug-free school culture. So I, I, I see where we're going here. Um, down the <laughs> path of normalizing healthy choices, creating those high expectations, SEL, meaning social emotional learning and coping skills, which again, with that APA um, very recent statement on adolescent youth and mental health, we have to help them with coping skills. That's just all there is to it. And then the restorative culture, which having that restorative culture allows kids to feel rewarded, not punished all the time. That's what I see, but I know there is a skill to it. And I'm going to be honest with you and in a lot of teacher schools, we don't really teach it because we were raised with more of a punitive culture. So help us understand how we move forward and kind of create this uh, culture. So I'll let you do the talking and, and help us understand what can we take today to use in our classroom tomorrow? That's what I'm hoping. Some tips and tricks and tools. Yes. Well, I mean, first of all, when it comes to normalizing healthy behaviors for young people in your life, and that means, yes, your students in the classroom, it also means your younger nieces and nephews, sons and daughters, is we realize that behavior is caught, not taught. So if you're teaching one thing, but demonstrating another, it's not getting through to them. So honestly, I'm just asking you, if you take away one thing from this slide, it is Good behavior is caught, not taught. They're going to catch it from you and they're going to model what you do. So how do you react in the classroom when a student is disrespectful? How do you model this thing when you're getting angry and upset or frustrated based on the outcomes in your classroom? Are you displaying that it's time to yell? It's time to punish? It's time like it's time to flex? Because if that's what you do, that's exactly what they're going to learn to do as well. So that is like step number one. And I know we we want to run this short podcast, so I don't have time for stories and illustrations. But that, to me, honestly, is just a great question to ask yourself. How can I de demonstrate what a healthy behavior is? And two, is when it comes to uh, different things that we celebrate in the classroom or that we acknowledge, is those students that are trying very, very hard. Let's celebrate that. Hey, I noticed that when everyone else was was goofing off and, you know, like playing games or doing something like you stuck to your homework and you were figuring this thing out. That's the consistency or that's the resilience it's going to take to be successful in life. Great job. Uh, can we celebrate that stuff? Uh, not just performance, but that attitude, those healthy behaviors. And when I think about even the students that I, I help in my youth group, I'm always sending these encouraging text messages to them saying, hey, thanks for treating that new person really well. Or thanks for thanks for making a, a, you know, a healthy choice. You told me that your goals were to make the basketball team. And I just noticed that you didn't eat all the pizza and cake tonight. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Like so you're, that. you're saying, you know, and you don't, it's not about the product. It's about the progress and really rewarding progress. So not eating that all the pizza, uh, you know, lends to the basketball team concept. I love that. So yeah. I will not forget that good behavior is caught, not taught, but also bad behavior is caught, not taught. So as a role model, as the adult, and I love how you said, even for your nieces and nephews and your, and your children, try to catch yourself in the good behavior. And that's how, you know, a restorative, you know, catch them doing something good to catch them, you know, whatever yeah. it happens to be. Yes. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I'll add one last thing for that <laughs> slide is yep. that the number one mistake that I do see is as an adult, we can catch ourselves saying things like, oh, I need a beer. Oh, I need a drink. Or uh, like, and that is our coping skill that we are now teaching our young people when you have a rough day, you turn to a drug. That oh, that is a hundred percent. Oh my gosh. That's per because, you know, teachers are, they talk in the hallway and the kids overhear them. Yes. And the wow. same for celebrations. Oh, the semester's over. Celebrate. Let's go get beers. Let's tell, let's say, Hey, let's go hang out together in front of the students. And we know you might drink a beer. That's okay. We know you might have a glass of wine. That's okay. But realize that the students want to be like you. They want to feel like an adult. So as the adult, we're modeling the behavior that we want for them. Uh, so yeah, 
I'll end on that. One. Okay. Thank you so much. Talk to us about having high expectations. This one looks kind of hard. <laughs> right. That target's pretty far away. And that's the way that students see things is that they think that their future is so far away that the things that they do don't matter. And what we know from the drug prevention field is that 90% of the people that struggle with addiction started using before the age of 18. We also know that using drugs before the age of 15 makes you five times more likely to develop an addiction. So what we really want to emphasize to young people is that your decisions that you make right now are extremely important to your future. In fact, they're probably more important now because your brain is still developing. So these high expectations are really to help them shoot for something high, something really, really great that they could do in their future and also help them believe that it's possible. And this is the key point, especially if you're working with demographics where their parents might not be in the home or they don't have a lot of money is you have to help instill that belief because they not, might not believe it themselves that they can have a great future. And that's going to help give them something to shoot for. And also it gives them something to lose. And huh. that's important because if you have nothing to lose, there's no reason why you shouldn't use drugs right now because you have nothing to lose. So give them a reason to shoot for great goals, to believe in themselves and develop a long-term mindset. Uh, because that's going to keep them on that path to continue after they have challenges, setbacks, failures, and turn to you for help as well. So I love that. And I, and I say, absolutely, I agree. However, I'm a teacher in the classroom and I have a student that is, yeah, from a really tough background. How do I help that student? You know, and I'm, look at me, I'm an upper, you know, middle-class white woman. I'm trying the best I can. I mean, that's the best part that I can bring to some of these kids to, help normalize, I suppose, this um, relationship. But I have a really hard time thinking, what can I tell them that they have nothing to lose? Like when I'm not living in their shoes, help me with that, Jake. Yeah, it's all about putting it on them. So learn about their goals, learn about their challenge, ask them, hey, what would you like your life to look like in five or 10 years? Do you think that you can do it? And then if they say, no, I can't do it, you could tell them, well, well I think you can. I see that you have these strengths in the classroom. And maybe, honestly, you might not even believe it at first. But did you know that when a student is acting out and getting stealing the attention from you in class and they're disrupting everything, that is insane leadership potential. Like, they, they absolutely are displaying strengths in the classroom. If they're quiet and maybe they're focused uh, or they're doing art, you know, they're it seems like they're not listening to you because they're doodling throughout class. Emphasize that creativity. I think that you're so creative that you could find a way to do this. And then they know at least there's one person, one caring adult who does think that I can do it. Maybe I can, you know, spark that possibility in their mind. I love it. Okay. So I can spark that possibility, even if I'm a little different from their cultural background. I love it. If you make it about them, exactly. It's all about make them. Make it about them. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about how we can help our students with that social emotional uh, development and learning and coping skills. This is really important. Yeah, I teased a little bit on it in the in the first slide, but it really does come back to number one, how you display it, is it's going to get caught. And then two is, are we actually teaching them these skills? You know, when life does get hard or when you're stressed, challenged or anxious. And this is just to show like a little bit of what this demographic, you know, these students that are young, what they're going through is anxiety and dealing with mental health issues is one of the top reasons why they say that they're using drugs in the first place. So they are seeing that they're saying that drugs are my coping skill. That's what I go to when I'm stressed, angry. And so in, we live in a culture too, where, I mean, any emotion you feel, the marketers at these drug and alcohol companies will sell you the idea that, well, you need to use my product now you feel any type of way, use my product. So mm -hmm. they're learning that that's what adults do by advertising. And they're spending billions of dollars as an industry, getting that into our brain. So we have to spend billions of dollars and hours erasing that and teaching alternatives. So for this, I mean, you now our country is coming to a place where we are emphasizing social and emotional learning and it's required in the classroom. So when we built our curriculum, we aligned it with 90% of the SEL standards that are required. We aligned it with over 60% of the counseling standards that are required for the nation to make sure that it's it's there. 
but it's all about giving them that practice, calling it out when you see it and asking, hey, this is how I observed that you reacted during this. How'd that work out? I love it. I love it. How did it work out? And and folks, I just want to also let everybody know that I will make sure that in the show notes, you have these five social emotional learning skills. And it's, there's some fantastic resources on the web that allow us as teachers to use these skills in our everyday lesson planning and how great your curriculum is aligned to utilizing these, these five social emotional learning skills. It's fabulous. We're going to move on to this next piece, restorative culture. How do you create a restorative culture, not knowing restorative practices? I'm a teacher. I, I learned a lot of things, but I didn't really get down in, you know, uh, in the depths of restorative practice. How do I do this? Yeah, well, the basics behind restorative practice is really that you are working with the person to find that common solution. So it's not, hey, I'm the authority and I'm going to punish you or I'm the authority and I'm going to tell you about how to behave. It's really a partnership. And that's what those hands um, show, you know, show is that like we're working with the students to help them achieve their desired outcomes. And it's really a reflection slide of like, hey, have we been doing that? If you look at your classroom or your school and someone is caught with, you know, a vaping device, which probably is happening right now, or they are caught with something or they make a mistake, which is, is going to happen in a young person's life. Are we, are we taking them out of their learning environment for that by suspending them uh, and putting them back in a situation that probably got them in trouble or where they have opportunities to smoke more and develop more addiction? Or are we educating them uh, with resources and with professionals who care about them, which is you, the teachers, counselors, principals, the people that would do anything for these students. Honestly, like I, I view it as a, a privilege when a student messes up around me. I'm like, whoa, this is a pivotal moment in their life. What an opportunity for us to do something good that it takes those moments to shift. So if a student is getting caught, like realize their insides are burning. They are scared for their life. And so for you to show up and say, not you're in trouble, you're going down, you're out of school, but instead, hey, let's figure this thing out. I love it. How, love how is this working? What can we do? What do you need? That's another question. Hey, what do you need? Okay. Um, because that's kind of all about restorative justice and culture is that framework. Um, and again, it, it does happen by what I think is policy change within our schools. Sure. Uh, so the, the more that we can sell this idea of keeping them there during the day and pouring into them, even when they make mistakes and realizing that's going to happen and it's a normal part of learning. I love that. I, I just that question, what do you need? I, I don't think it has to be um, charged. Um, it doesn't have to be shaming, as you as you mentioned. It's just a question. What do you need? And I love the, uh, uh, the opportunity concept. Yeah. You get caught. Okay, they're burning on the inside, but what is the opportunity to change this? And, and we have that power, I think, as the teacher, as that uh, adult that's respected to at least give that a go. I, yeah. So much here. I know we don't have <laughs> much time, but um, continue. So, so what do you do when you come into schools? Um, fun and connection. So I can imagine. I just right here. I'm seeing it. This is fun. Look at this kid's mind <laughs> having a blast. So tell us about fun and connection. Yes. Uh, so basically, this is how we wrap every one of our materials that we develop. Uh, whether it's you know myself, Tomas, or Brian facilitating our assemblies or curriculums or if it's us teaching you how to do it, it's this, this, this topic of drug prevention is not like a sexy topic. It's not naturally fun or engaging or attractive. So we have to make it that way by creating an experience. And so that's really what we do is when we work with schools is how do we get the students to buy in and how do we help them connect? And when you think back to that story I told you at the beginning, is what I left out is before I created this movement, I felt like I could not have fun on campus because no one was like me. No one was living without alcohol and drugs. And I, that also meant that I wasn't connecting with people. And that if I could tell you every moment in my mind where I thought to myself, it would be easier if I just started drinking and smoking. I would fit in 
life would be so easy, like my social life. And now put yourselves in, the, in that shoes of a young person. Or remember when you were young, you weren't making decisions based on what you learned in school or what the long-term health benefits were. You were making decisions on what can I do to make friends right now and have fun right now and to feel like I belong to something. So that's really where the program heads is like, not only where are we going to educate your students, but we're going to provide opportunities for them to throw these parties and events and get sponsors and give them ownership over their community change. And that's the thing about Gen Z and these, these students coming up right now, they want to change the world desperately. They're looking for opportunities like this where they can own the idea and they can make a change at their school. And I just hear belonging all over that. These these kids behind you, they look like they feel like they belong. That's <laughs> yes. pretty amazing. All right. Woo, gifty, gift time. Tell us what yeah. we're, what's our gifty. Yes. So um we talked about a lot of ideas. You have a few takeaways and mindsets you can use in the classroom. This is something for you as you know, as an adult. Uh you we realize that adults are the number or one of the top protective factors from risky decisions. So you can have this free resource from me that we developed for uh, for adults, teachers, parents. Again, this is just a cool thing to go over to see practically how can I prevent drug use in my own home. Uh, so feel free to share this. Put it in your guidance counselor's office for when parents come in or anything like that. Um, feel free to use it, print it, share it. Uh, and our information is on there. And one that we missed for restorative justice We'll go over the podcast next that you'll be invited to. There's an episode I want you to check out too. I am excited. I just, myself, I here's my phone. I just took a picture of it. Uh, using my QR code. I'm excited and I will be utilizing it. And I'm even more excited about this because I'm a super podcast junkie. So I really love this concept of party talk. Tell me all about party talk. Yes. Um, I don't know which episode it is, but... If you really resonated with the restorative justice one, there's something you can use in the classroom, like a script, honestly, that's on one of the episodes. Uh, and it's called restorative conversations, restorative communications. Um, but I, I was so stoked about it that I just recorded an episode on it and you can go there and check it out. But yes, every Monday morning on your way to work, if you want to get inspired and build a healthy culture, go check it out. Um, it's super helpful and practical. And inspirational too, because I interview counselors, people in drug prevention coalitions, programmers, all that kind of stuff. This is awesome. I'm seeing one secrets to getting hundreds of students to party sober. I can't wait to 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 listen to it. So thank you so much, Jake. I am just I'm just thrilled that you are out there, that you are in our community, literally taking on a very challenging subject. I know that students need this now more than ever. Oh my goodness, teachers need it. Just to understand that, yes, you're doing the right thing. There is hope with this chat, that with this group of youth. Um, between the pandemic and all of this um, social media, oh my gosh, AI is coming, you know, fast and furious. The kids need, they need some hope. They need some something to hold on to. And what more than connection? You made it very, very clear that connection is, is what they're craving. So I know that I took away caught, not taught. Behavior is caught, not taught. So I'm going to make sure that I watch myself before I react. Um, I also loved what you say about celebrations. Like when you say celebration, it doesn't attach itself with go get a beer or go get a glass of wine. I love that too. Making sure that even if that's something that we do as adults, that we are not, you know, making that something that our students think that is a part of coping and or celebrating. Um, the hard part for me will be the goals. Like how, what's your goal and how do you in uh, how do I walk in your shoes? You you were very, very clear. I don't have to walk necessarily in shoes, but I can believe in them and I can ask them, what do you need? What do you need? And how can, how can I, you, you've got the strength of a leader. I can see it because in your disruption, for example. So I love <laughs> that. Um, so those are some really key takeaways that I took from today. And I so thank you for being with us. Um, and this last QR code, is this going to take me to your services so that I can book Jake White and team? Yes, that'll go right to our website. And you'll have all the links there if you need to explore videos, testimonials. Um, check out some of our videos. It displays how, like, the fun experience. There's drumming. There's game shows. Uh, there's students on stage with us. It's a blast. 
my gosh, I, I can't wait. And I also think it's absolutely fabulous that you are here on the Grand Canyon University campus with your wife, Emily. Um, you're living the dream and, and we just are so appreciative. Uh, folks, please connect with us on social media. You're going to find all kinds of, I will be pointing in our show notes to Jake White, all of these resources. So don't worry about it. If you didn't catch a QR code, we'll make sure all of those uh, resources are in our YouTube show notes. Um, please subscribe now for more free PD. We are on all the time. We we actually drop every Wednesday of the first Wednesday of the month. So I like how you said every episode drops every Monday. So you've got something on Monday, something on Wednesdays. Uh, we are so excited that you chose to spend time with us today at our Canyon PD uh, Wednesday webinar. Thank you so much, Jake White, for being with us and keep up the great work. Thank you for what you do for kids every day. Thanks, Jake. Take care until next time. Thanks, Corey.